So I have to confess something. Most new watch releases really don't get me that excited. There's always something wrong. The size, the color, the price, some strange decision in its design, a measurement here, a measurement there, or it might just be the hype surrounding a particular release. That always kind of turns me off as well. Even watches that I normally would be actually interested in. And in the end, no matter how innovative a watch or new tech might be, JLC, or the Seiko that is grand, always seems to find a way to eclipse it pretty much every year. So we always end up talking about the incremental minutiae of changes that Rolex have made, another bloody Black Bay, and I still love you Tudor, or Seiko raising their prices without fixing the QC again. Well this year it was different, very different. There's so much to be excited about. And being a sucker for anything Art Deco, as some of you may know I collect Art Deco antiques, Omega, in my opinion, quietly and rather unceremoniously, have made one of the best new watches of 2022. So let's take a closer look with an unboxing and mini review. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, an extremely cool watch indeed. Possibly one of the best releases of 2022. Certainly in my opinion. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Uh, and now normally I don't borrow two watches back to back from Moya Fine Jewelers, but I could not pass up this opportunity. Uh, so a massive thank you to Moya for lending this in. They are, of course, an authorized dealer for Omega. Now, I'll do a wristwatch check, get it out of the way. This is the Dan Henry 1972. I'm wearing it because, of course, the new Top Gun movie, well, at the time of recording this, has just been released, inspired deeply by the Porsche design that was in the original. And I hear, I think in the new one, there's a IWC or something. I'm not quite sure. Please, no spoilers in the comments, but naturally, uh, you can see Tom Cruise there. Naturally, I'm a fan and I'm excited to see it. So, with that out of the way, let's take a look at this absolutely strepitoso Omega. So why is this watch so important? Well, as always, a little bit of history to help contextualize. The movie Dunkirk is not only a clever depiction, in how it effectively utilizes time in its narrative structure and therefore elevating the sense of tension, but most importantly, the way it captures the fundamental importance of timekeeping during conflict. I'm not just saying this to hype it up, but Amiga's contribution to the war effort cannot be ignored. As we all know, there were many different brands supplying the Allied forces with timekeeping equipment, but the vast majority was Omega. And in conflict, every decision, every second, every mechanical tool was crucial. Without Omega and the reliability of their watches, it would have been a very different flag flying on the moon decades later. The movie had a profound impact on me especially for my appreciation of Amiga in general. This is not something I've felt for a long time, since the glory days of the N64 and thrashing friends on Goldeneye during the 90s Brosnan Bond era. For those new to the channel, that 007 Seamaster was my first luxury watch as a result. So back in 2017, immediately after seeing Christopher Nolan's most accomplished work, I think, in my opinion, at least, I rushed home, jumped on eBay, and I scored what's colloquially known as the Spitfire watch, which has the legendary 30T2 movement inside. The 30T2 
is one of, if not the most important calibers Amiga ever produced. It might not seem like much, but this simple little manual wind movement lay the foundations in terms of everything mechanical that came after it from Amiga to this very day. It was also the reason for the brand's successes at chronometric competitions during the 40s and into the late 60s. So robust and dependable were the descendants of these movements that in 1956 they famously strapped a Seamaster to the outside of a plane. Inside was a movement just like the one in my vintage Seamaster. It was able to survive the extreme external conditions of the flight from Amsterdam all the way to Canada. Afterwards, when it was examined by the airplane captain and airport officials, it was found to be working perfectly and I quote, keeping very good time. I've got an old favorite back, the Opinel. There it is. Um, with the uh, customized sensing by a fan. Shout out to Ken there, an old favorite of the channel. Uh, very affordable, great, great French classic iconic knives. <laughs> Drum roll, please. Oh my God. Blued hands, thermally blued hands are singing immediately out of the box. Look at that. Wow. Oh, and it's not that tall, which is fantastic because it is, of course, a manual wind. Ooh, wait, wait for it, wait for it. There they go. Let's just zoom in a little bit here. Nice. Look at those blued hands. It really comes alive. So this is a numbered edition. How many? This is just number 302. I don't know how many there are. Let's just double check that uh, diameter. It is 39, okay. What's that thickness? 11.5 at the top of the uh, domed sapphire there. Yeah, pretty big, 45. Okay, not, not a bad size. 20 millimeters uh, lug width. I've gone into detail about the Metas uh, master chronometer testing and all the different things involved from magnetism to pressure testing, etc, etc. So I'll spare you the long list, but it's significantly far away from just bog standard COSC certification. The only other company uh, around this price and less that comes close is of course the previously discussed Fortis in my recent Speedmaster Alternatives video. Their emphasis is more on robustness because obviously tested for space etc etc. It's more about shock resistance than magnetic resistance and accuracy. So a lot more involved than just standard you know different positions and measuring you know how many seconds etc. It is very impressive. Have a look at the Metas website for more information but yeah it's quite astounding. Nobody comes close to this at this level. That's just a fact. They don't put the word master before chronometer for nothing. Aside from the actual timekeeping precision, the most notable attributes are the massively boosted 72 hour power reserve, thanks to the twin barrels and the resistance to magnetic fields reaching 15,000 Gauss. And this is due to the free sprung balance with the silicon hairspring effectively making it a great Monday to Friday everyday watch to handle all the evils of magnetism we encounter. Even as I narrate these words, these fields radiate from my laptop, camera, sound equipment, etc. Take this watch off the wrist during the weekend for something more adventurous and it will still be going strong Monday morning, as 72 hours is three days. This is all made possible by the very impressive in-house movement. The Caliber 8926 features a full balance bridge for added stability, but my favorite aspect has to be the very unique three positions when setting the crown. When fully in in the first position, it winds the watch like any other watch of this kind. When pulled out to the second position, it sets the hours independently with 12 hour increments, kind of like a GMT hat. Then in the third position for the minutes, it's like a regular watch. This may not seem like much, but it makes it extremely precise in its time setting ability and takes full advantage of the sector dial design by working in conjunction with it. This is supremely functional and efficacious watchmaking. So as a result, it's not just a sector dial for its nostalgic looks, it's actually very nifty and useful. 
These clever design traits are precisely why you cannot review a watch from pictures. That's merely conjecture. You have to experience these things to, to understand its characteristics. Not only that, how it rarely wears. Its 11 millimeter thickness is very cuff friendly, even with that quite pronounced domed sapphire crystal uh, with the AR coating, I should add as well, which is a nice touch. And I have to say, the winding, the, the, the crown is beautifully proportioned. I was concerned it was a little undersized actually, but you know what, it's, it's very ergonomically efficient to grab. So um, yeah, and it's really smooth. I've never experienced the manual wind this smooth. Again, only things you can do in a real review like this, not from pictures. Let's talk a little bit about sector dials. Well, there's not much here to talk about. It's all about concentric circles, circles within circles to indicate hours and minutes, and that's basically it. But what's interesting is this was very much a trend in the 1930s. Today, it's carried on most famously by brands, high-end brands like JLC and Patek, of course. So it's very much synonymous with horology, even though ironically, like most watches, it started off uh, as a military style of watch. So its roots were all about functionality and utility. Because of that connotation with the Hort Horology brands, it's, uh, you know, it's associated with dress watches now. But if you look back, most watches of that era just looked like dress watches. It was a more elegant age. Everybody was dressed better, you know, <laughs> and the watches were certainly more handsome as a result. The dial is made and marked 925 silver and therefore has a subtle kind of smoky greyish hue to it, contrasting superbly with the navy blue printing, obviously chosen to match the thermally blued hands, which we'll talk about again later. We have the Deco era Amiga logo and then underneath a Gaudi-esque Art Nouveau typeface from the pre-Deco period. The dial to me immediately evokes Spitfires, co-branded Tissot chronographs and the bygone era of machine age elegance. Speaking of which, the watch takes direct inspiration from the Amiga CK859 of 1939 with the classic Calatrava style three-part case and despite the glory days of Art Deco being very much over as a whole by then, especially with its dominance ending with the world taking a very much darker turn by the end of that year. Despite this, the style did carry on and was still very much a big influence. Art Deco combines traditional fine craftsmanship with modern styles, usually using rich materials. It represented exuberant luxury, but also technological progress and function. This watch is the perfect match as it blends high-end watchmaking with a practical, streamlined, modern design aesthetic. It's almost as if the fully automated Metas, along with the ultra-precise machine decoration and manufacturing, were made for this watch. The Art Deco style was very much about this confluence of styles. Just look at most scenes from Fritz Lang's Metropolis to see exactly what I mean. The Geneva waves in arabesque swirls give a sense of motion that would be right at home on the Pierre Pateau designed interior decor of a cruise liner, locomotive or, or the architecture of that age. The high polished beveling, thermally blackened screws and display back make me forget I'm looking at an Amiga for a moment, but rather something from Patek, Cartier, VC or JLC. Coincidentally, these are all brands that very much had their heyday during this more old money aristocratic stylings of the 1930s, compared to the flashy status symbol offerings that they are more associated with today. I could see the likes of Bertie Wooster wearing this, wishing past in a roadster. Ultimately, what Art Deco always got right, that so often is lost in today's aesthetically uglier world, is symmetry and balance, if you had not guessed from the intro. This is certainly something that most sector dials demonstrate perfectly. Look at the way the subdial, how it's proportioned, the scale, shapes used, and how everything is presented so well in relation to everything else. It flows so harmoniously that Fibonacci himself would have been proud. One of the biggest advantages of this style is strap compatibility. While rubber straps are obviously too contemporary, 
bung it on an affordable wrist candy watch club olive NATO and suddenly its military roots shine through. Swap it out for a croc, ostrich, suede or alligator or something even distressed and you can get a ton of different looks for formal or casual attire. Almost, but not quite, a certifiable strap monster. Okay, so what are the negatives? Well, brace yourself, uh, you know it's coming. Uh, the size. And yeah, I can sense a thousand eyes rolling uh, right now. <laughs> now. And I've, yeah, I've said it a million times. Uh, hear me out. Here is a little story just to get it into perspective. When you spend years designing a watch and hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment are at stake, watch size matters massively. The Laurier Safari is a perfect example of this big risk. And yes, it takes even that kind of big money, years of fortitude and passion, to produce a relatively simple watch. One thing we were adamant about was the 36mm diameter. In our hearts, we knew it was the right size. But even so, on the day of launching, I could not help but feel slightly trepidatious. There was a part of me that was worried it was too period correct or too small for most. Thankfully, the watch sold out in literally a few minutes, proving there is a demand out there for more classically retro proportioned watches. Omega being part of the humongous Swatch empire can afford to take more risks. And if anyone can take a gamble, it's them. So I would have loved to see a 36 mm version. Naturally, if I had several hundreds of thousands of dollars more to invest, I would have made a 39 mm version of the Safari. With two versions, you could please both large and smaller wrists. Unfortunately, with finding the perfect size for a modern watch that pleases all, it will always be a Goldilocks and the Three Bears scenario. But for those with larger wrists of seven inches and beyond, you will be more than happy with the CK859. For those like me, the size leaves me feeling a long way away from the verisimilitude of my vintage Seamaster. Naturally, the low 30 meters water resistance and the lack of loom makes the watch a lot less capable as a do-it-all timepiece. I feel it was a missed opportunity on both accounts. The numerals could have easily been loomed, but I do struggle to think how they could have applied it to the majestic fountain pen nib style handset. These are, after all, some of the biggest blued hands I've ever seen, and adding loom would have undoubtedly ruined them. So the only thing I can think of is a different type of handset, maybe something like the ones in a Flieger, for example. This watch is not just another one of their endless paradoxical limited edition speedies or another James Bond Seamaster for the wannabe 007s. This is something for the true horologist who appreciates the brand's history. In the never-ending pissing contest with their great nemesis Rolex, it's also a bold statement. In fact, it aims more at the holy trinity of horology rather than the five-pointed crown. In my opinion, this says far more about the importance of the brand than any insane depths a diver can go like the recent Ultra Deep. Outside of Superhaul horology watchmaking, today Omega has set the bar higher than any other brand in terms of the level of testing, accuracy and quality control when it comes to their movements. This is achieved by their Westworld style automated Metas chronometer testing and manufacturing. So a watch honoring the 30T2 is Amiga basically saying, remember when we were the best in the world at making accurate, super reliable watches? Well, once again, we are the best in this price range. Retailing at just over six grand, it offers extremely competitive value and quality for the money. This could possibly be the best reissue of all time. In fact, it's comparable to the Command & Conquer Remastered Edition, if we were talking computer games. Like that historically important game, it flaunts its attention to detail at every chance it can. The CK859 does not break new ground like the Ultra Deep, and I doubt it will ever set the watch world alight like the Moon Swatch did. But what it does do is it shows Amiga doesn't have to rely on hype, hysteria, and product placement for that nostalgia. Instead, it's just really good taste. Industry-leading technology and design led by its own illustrious history. A tribute to a movement 
that helped us from living in a nightmarish man in the high castle reality. So, unequivocally, undoubtedly, unashamedly, pure class. Uh, yeah, it's really got me excited to see what else Omega pulls out of the archives. One of the best releases of the year for me, definitely, uh, which will probably be completely ignored by the watch world. Who knows? But I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I love it. and. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it too. Had it been 36mm, of course I would have jumped on it, possibly would have been the next grail. Then again, that's why I came up with the, or co-designed the Safari with Laurier. And I'm glad we did it before this because, yeah, I wouldn't want to be accused of copying this, uh, even though I'd love to do a homage for this. Anyway, stay tuned for lots more co-designed and original designs. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. I'm really intrigued to hear your thoughts on this. Where does this put Amiga? What do you like about it, dislike? Speaking of which, please don't forget to like this video, especially if you want to support more free, independent content unsponsored like this. Right, thank you for watching. Onwards and upwards, and I'll catch you in the next one. Ciao.